Okay, well, it's seven and um, all the technical stuff looks like it's cycling up. I guess if this was, if we were inside the TARDIS, we'd start to hear it, you know, throbbing and humming away. Matt, is Matt's it there. Yeah. <laughs> How's it going down? It's good. Sorry, I was just distracted. Uh, it's going good. Anywhere in time and space you want to go, I'll take you there. <laughs> to the good after. Hands. Can you take us to the after of where we are right now? <laughs> right. It's much better. A propos to the to the panel tonight. It's going to be great. Excellent. You're going to love it. Yeah. Everybody will be very happy. Everyone will be happy. Yeah. Hello and welcome to Bookswell Read and Relate, a vid chat series celebrating books. I'm your host, Cody Sisko, and today we've got a luminous lineup of uh, science fiction and futurist thinkers who are going to talk about writing better futures in times of crisis. Uh, we started this series in order to continue our mission of connecting readers and writers in um, online during this uh, time and of amplifying the voices of writers from marginalized communities. I'm very pleased to announce that going forward, this series will be monthly and will be continuing in collaboration with the Exposition Park branch of the Los Angeles Public Library system. So hooray, and thank you, um, Eugene Owens, who you'll hear from in a minute. My co-host tonight is Kate Mariyama, and I'll let her um, introduce the topic uh, in a moment after Eugene. So with that, um, Eugene, if you wanna say uh, uh, some words about the library and its programming, um, I'm going to turn this over to you. There we go. And you're spotlighted now, so people should be able to see you. <laughs> Hi. Thank you, everyone, so much for having us in your home or wherever you are right now. I'm so excited to be hosting with Cody some authors that I actually have on my shelf in this library. I'm not actually there right now, but uh, that is the Exposition Park Regional Library. It's the biggest library in South Central Los Angeles. We provide programming, like all of our libraries in LA, every week for all ages. And this is one of the great, exciting things we get to do in this uh, very strange time we're all living through, is to bring the library to you at home. And if you follow us on Facebook or any kind of social media at LHEL, you can find our Twitter and our Instagram and our Facebook accounts. And we're promoting authors and activities and story times pretty much every day of the week that you can access at any time. We also have a wonderful uh, new design for our website that's called LHDL at Home, and you can find that at LHDL.org. Hi, so um, I think this all started over some very good barbecue in Texas with Cody, uh, so I'm very uh, grateful he's hosting us tonight. My name's Kate Mariyama. I'm a writer and teacher in Los Angeles, and I'm most interested in talking to the panelists we've gathered here tonight. I teach a class in Antioch University Los Angeles's BA program called American Horror Story that looks at genre fiction in terms of how it reflects on what it says about society in the time it was written. But in this class, we also look at Afrofuturism and concepts around how what we write might have an effect on current culture or for better or for worse. Um, I've got some great panelists this evening, and I'm going to have them introduce themselves, uh, talk a bit about the kinds of things that they write, and what angle they're coming from for this conversation. For their full and very impressive bios, um, I strongly suggest you check out uh, bookswell.club, and we'll give you the link for that later. Um, but for right now, I uh, want to welcome Cecil Castellucci, Matt Kressel, PJ Manny, Cherie L. Smith, and Nisi Shaw. Um, and I wondered, Cecil, if you could kick off introducing yourself and telling us a little bit about the work that you do and a little bit about the angle you're coming from for this conversation. Um, sure. Hi, my name is Cecil Castellucci. Um, I write novels, mostly young adults, uh, and uh, short stories, and also comic books. Right now, the bulk of my work is, um, is in comic books and um, using uh, licensed superheroes. Um, uh, I, a lot of my um, young adult science fiction, I'm really interested in the idea of community and how we build communities um, together, sort of in outer space or, uh, you know, it, with, on a hell planet um, uh, and how how that sort of strength of coming together 
um, rather than uh, fighting each other. And I'm really inspired by my friend Cory Doctorow, who um, talks about that a lot, like what would happen if, um, you know, things fell apart and instead of uh, defending your house with a gun, that you came over with a cake, um, you know, to your neighbor. Um, so uh, currently I write Batgirl, um, but most recently I rebooted The Female Furies, uh, which were created by Jack Kirby and reinvented Shade the Changing Man into Shade the Changing Girl. Um, I've written the Princess Leia Star Wars novel, and um, I have my own science fiction duology called Tin Star and Stone in the Sky, which is about an, um, a, a young human girl who is abandoned on an alien space station and has to learn how to survive, and she's the only human there. And when other humans show up a few years later um, after a galactic war, she has to figure out what it means to be human again. Cool. All right. Um, Nisi? Well, uh, let's see. Uh, um, I write mostly short stories, but I did uh, write a novel called Everfair that was a Nebula finalist. Um, a long time ago, my short story collection, Filter House, won an award. Um, it was a winner of the James Tiptree Jr. Uh, award for expanding and exploring our understanding of gender. Um, I also write critical stuff. Um, I'm pretty well known for a book called Writing the Other, uh, and I teach courses based on that. It's about how to write uh, more authentically about people who are of a different demographic than yourself. And um, today I was working on a short story that's part of a series about a, an imaginary uh, social movement um, that I think is pretty pertinent to what we're gonna talk about tonight. Um, oh, cool. The Five Petals of Thought, which I had a dream about, but no, it doesn't exist. Yeah. <laughs> I'm interested to hear about that. Um, all right, Matt, take it away. Hi, um, I'm Matthew Kressel. Um, I'm a uh, speculative fiction writer and a coder. Um, three of my short stories were finalists for the Nebula Award, and one of them was a finalist for the UG Foster Memorial Award. Um, you may also know me if you're a speculative fiction writer, if you've ever submitted through the Moksha submission system, that's something that, that I made. Uh, if you Venmo me 50 bucks, I'll give you automatic acceptance. No, I'm just kidding. Um, <laughs> and uh, I also uh, co-host the... Uh, Fantastic Fiction at KGB Reading Series in Manhattan, which right now is doing this. We're doing it virtually instead of in person. Uh, so if you couldn't make it to New York City before, now you can come to the uh, readings. And we're, we're having one actually next week, um, the 20th, uh, 7 p.m. Eastern time. Uh, but it's gonna be on YouTube so that you can uh, view it anytime if you, can't, if you can't watch it that particular time. And our readers will be Leanna Re Renee Heber and Alana C. Meyer. Uh, so, my approach to this topic uh, is sort of um, roundabout in that, in that my favorite film growing up was Blade Runner. And uh, Blade Runner is an extremely, obviously, dystopian film. Um, one of the things that I noticed about the film was that it was copied everywhere. Uh, its vision of the future became the quote-unquote default vision. And I started to realize that we, we basically fetishized dystopia. Dystopias became cool, they became sexy. And I had a real problem with this because I, I found that um, if we limit, and I, I'll get into this a little bit more as we, we go on, but I, I found that as we limit um, our visions of the future, uh, what, we, what we believe is possible is limited as well. So I think like part of the problem is, is, um, is a failure of imagination about what the future could be. Uh, so, uh, especially in my, my more recent fiction, I've been intentionally trying to counter that uh, default dystopian narratives. Cool. All right. Uh, Cherie? Oh, okay. Hi. I am Cherie L. Smith, and I write young adult, middle grade, and um, younger fiction and nonfiction 
um, I'm sort of cross genre, but I am here today um, because I'm the Lorax. I speak for the trees. I, um, I think it's my book, Orleans, is what brought me here today to an extent. Um, my mother was a Katrina survivor, and um, I wrote this book based off of an extrapolation of a future post-disaster New Orleans. Um, and I'm struck by, um, I think we're seeing it now, I'm struck by how um, Mother Nature is course correcting humanity um, and how can we, um, how can we join rather than try to fight the flow. I've also, um, I also write comics and um, I've been working on James Cameron's Avatar books, which are also a very, um, eco-sensitive message um, because that is a story that takes place on a world where the um, um, the beings on the planet are connected to a sentient entity that is the the planet itself um, and uh, yeah that that that's short and sweet I'll leave it at that <laughs> great thank you and I wanted to um, bring us home with PJ uh, because she uh, in a conversation with me see it up panel um, out of that came um, her Facebook page, which is a meeting space for uh, writers of um, science fiction and speculative fiction. Uh, anyway, PJ? Hi there, uh, I'm PJ Manny, and I write near-term science fiction, which is, as many people here can attest, not so much fun anymore because the craziness of our time, the acceleration of progress and the acceleration of strange turns of events has made it hard for near-term writers like myself to keep up. So I wrote a book called Revolution, published in 2015. It was nominated for a Philip K. Dick Award. And uh, there's a sequel, Identity, and I'm finishing the third book of the trilogy, Conscience, which should be out early next year. I also write nonfiction, uh, both academic papers uh, in the space of empathy creation through storytelling, and uh, one's called Empathy in the Time of Technology, How Storytelling Creates Empathy. The other one is Yucky Gets Yummy, How Speculative Fiction Creates Society. And through those works, I've studied how we as storytelling species have taken stories that have once frightened us turned them around, made them our own stories, and now the people who we once feared are now our heroes. Uh, so back in 2018, I was on a panel with Nisi and Elsa Shunison, I have no idea how to pronounce her last name, and Gordon Van Gelder. And it was called Science Fiction in the Time of President Trump. And it was an extraordinary event for me. It was actually one of those epiphanies when has in your life and we were talking within a, a setting where none of us were bashing politics what we were coming to was this idea that the stories we had been telling were inadequate that we had trained an entire generation of young people to see the world through dystopic eyes so they knew that they were they were prepared to fight the problem was we never told them what they were fighting for. We knew what we were fighting against, the bad guy. But the world that we were trying to create at the end of many of these incredibly famous and wildly successful franchises is either the status quo or we don't really know, or they're crushed by the system. So we had this moment of, why are we not all doing something that flies in the face of dystopic stories? And if we can create new myths, new metaphors, you know, it was Joseph Campbell who said to change the story, you have to change the myth and change the metaphor. And that there's no way to come up with new solutions until we actually come up with a way to reframe the story. Cool. All right. Does anybody want to uh, chime in on that idea? Yeah, Cecil. <laughs> Just, I'm, I'm struck with something because I know, and I'm sure Cherie can um, weigh in on this as well. 
I love what you said, PJ, about how, you know, we've taught kids, you know, sort of like what, you know, that they have to fight against something, but, um, you know, but, but against what? Um, one thing that I always was struck about with dystopian fiction, which is so huge in the young adult world, um, is, uh, is that a lot of it um, is not, it is also a metaphor for school you know, um, and sort of fighting against school and fighting against the man um, in school. And so I think that, um, that like, what, what happens is that in a lot of those books, you're, you're very right, like it just ends, there's no real solution. Um, and they don't sort of offer what the, you know, utopia looks like. And, and a lot of those young adult books are very confusing because they start off by something where it's a utopia that they were trying to make and it, it quickly <laughs> took a turn south to a dystopia. And so um, I, I just, I don't really have a point except that I really feel like that, that, I, that sweet spot of like being in high school and being an in institution that you need to rebel against um, is such a, a vital part, but but um, but how do we give them the tools to then sort of self educate? You know, if if it's about right. school, to um, to figure out how they how they have the actual tools and the actual education to rebuild the world. Yeah, you don't have to raise your hand; just unmute, and you're good. Oh well, I was going to say um, that I went to a hippie school, <laughs> so um, so I think I might have like fallen into some little fold in, in this where um, I had the experience of having to rebel against uh, a dystopian nightmare of a high school. And then I went from there to the place where, you know, we were like baking bread and teaching each other French and, you know, um, going on nature walks and stuff. And, and it was, a maybe that's why I'm attracted to utopia because I had a utopian high school experience. Interesting. That's a really interesting idea. I would have liked a utopian high school experience. I think <laughs> mine was pretty average. And I, I tend to not want to write in high school. I, I, I am now because it was supposed to be contemporary and now it's going to be speculative because there's no such thing as contemporary anymore. But I, um, I don't tend to think of it in terms of fighting against a system. And, and I try to be careful about my language because we use battle language and war language for so many things. And I think that um, sometimes there's not a fight, there's a situation. Yeah, I agree. And that doesn't mean that there can't be a solution for the situation, but we don't, we don't need to be fighting all the time. And so uh, to what you said, PJ, about... Um, about Joseph Campbell. So I, a couple of years ago, I got my certificate in enchantivism, which is um, a, a form of activism for introverts. And there is, um, it uses, it's amazing. It's, it, so it uses deep storytelling, um, archetypes, uh, dream tending and interpretation. And then there's an element of um, ecotherapy and parapsychology. Um, so that you pay attention to a landscape um, and how it informs you, like where you were born informs where you're from. Um, but all of this is combined with using myth to um, understand the world that we are in right now and to sort of elevate uh, the problems of today to the level of myth um, so that we can look for solutions without all of our real world attachments and then sort of bring it back down from there and try to apply it. Um, and I think that, um, you know, regardless of your age, but I think high school, adolescence, there's definitely, there's tons of, um, there's an undercurrent of archetypes um, going on. And um, I'm sort of rambling now, but I want to say, make a point about um, tapping into that flow in order to inspire people and also to recognize that there's the second thing I teach in a couple of MFA programs, and there's the second thing of we in the West teach people to write drama. And everyone thinks utopia is placid, flat, stagnant. Mm -hmm. And it's simply not the case. So people fight the idea of, oh, how could you write utopian fiction? It would be boring. Uh, to which I always say, have you ever tried to keep something perfect? You know? 
I challenge you to walk outside wearing white and see what happens, you know? Um, so I think we need to teach, starting young, we need to teach people that it is something you can aspire to and you should write about that aspiration toward and the drama comes from trying to keep the stability. The drama also jump comes from that. different ideas. So I'm sorry, go on. No, please go ahead, PJ. I was going to say that a lot of the, the drama comes off from people having different ideas about what the best way forward is. Absolutely. And, you know, the, the, the point is in, you know, we're, we're taught in writing, every scene is a goal than an obstacle. The obstacle doesn't have to be the bad guy. In fact, in a lot of this literature, there isn't a bad guy. There's just conflicting views of what society should be. Exactly. Yeah, that's why I was saying that like a lot of times, like a lot of these dystopias come from the idea of trying to become a utopia, you know, that it's sort of like the best intentions mis mislaid in some way. But I was really inspired by Sheree. I didn't know anything about Enchantivism and um, she was telling me about it and she actually uh, started a, she did a, a literary magazine and I found it to be really refreshing to try to, I wrote a short story for her with that sort of in mind. And it was such an amazing, as a writer, it was such an amazing challenge to, like you say, PJ, try to reframe what a mythology was and to, and to in infuse kindness into it in some way. I want to jump off a little bit of what uh, Sherry was saying a minute ago in that, um, you know, oftentimes when I uh, talk online about writing optimistic fiction, um, I, get, I get resistance. People are like, well, how do you have, how can you, have conflict if it's an optimistic story? How do you, where's the conflict there? And, um, you know, I, I think you, you, uh, you hit the nail on the head, Sherry. You know, for, for me, you know, utopia is a verb. It, it's something that you, you. aspire Yay. towards. It's not <laughs> something that, that is. And, you know, I'm, I'm even hesitant to, to use that word because I feel like there's a lot of uh, so-called baggage on it. It's, you know, when you say utopia, people actually, oftentimes think of dystopia, you know, um, they think of the, of the perfect world that goes bad. So um, I, I think that a lot of the, uh, the, the tension that, that in, in my particular uh, interest is, is that the tension of trying to create that world, trying to take the world we have, or maybe a near future world that we have and make it better. How do we do that? What types of conflicts what me, might we have in the in the uh, in the reaching toward that goal and the steps we take toward that? What what are the what are the conflicts that we're going to have? And I think that's a really interesting uh, place to explore because I think it's really really close to to where we are. And people instead of having this like far future, you know, uh, Gene Roddenberry like utopia, you have a future where it's like just a little bit ahead of where we are. And people say, huh. You know, all it takes is a little bit of push to get us there, just a little bit beyond where we are now. This is achievable. This is doable. Well, I, I, I love what um, someone who's in the, uh, the audience is saying. Um, everyone's idea of utopia is different because I really tried to get to that with, uh, with Everfair, with having 11 viewpoint characters, and they all had a different idea mm -hmm. of what utopia would be. Right. Uh, so yeah, we're on the same page there. But I also think that conflict as a trope, as a way of approaching story in Western literature is oversold. Um, I think that um, tension is fine, just tension, tension and resolution. Um, you know, something has to be and then finally is but uh, along the way it's it's not it's not it's not it's not and then finally it is and that to me is is the story of utopia you know i want i want to put forth um another sort of model of writing um my, my last novel is a world war ii japan story and i wanted to use um japanese story structure um it's called kisha tenketsu and it is yeah. And its essence, it's conflict free. It is an introduction to the world, a deepening knowledge of the world, a twist of some sort, and then the world that we've learned here in light of that twist. And I think that that might be an interesting model on which to hang a utopian story. Um, yeah. Whether it is starting before the, before, uh, you know, whether it's starting in a dystopia or an imperfect world that um, 
that needs changing and the twist is, and then we had a change and then here we are, or even within the, the utopia and sort of modeling how to absorb a challenge or a problem um, using our imaginations, so. Kishu Tenkatsu is something that I've yes. tried to use in teaching my students. It's like, wait, you're a beginner? Okay, let's begin with the right <laughs> How does that go? Are they are they adept at it or? Resistant? They love it. They oh, love it. They love, they love being trusted with the idea that they can figure things out and not just go the same old way that everyone has always gone in this area. It's really interesting because for me, I have to. I've had to unlearn this. So I came out of film and television, and mm -hmm. having to unlearn the classic Hollywood tropes, mm -hmm. and that, you know, it, again, the, the conflict resolution doesn't have to be something with a good guy and a bad guy. Um, that was a real eye opener for me because I'd spent my entire career in a business where, you know, yes, there are plenty of stories of people, you know, fighting the hurricane or fighting the, you know, whatever the, the natural disaster was. Um, but ultimately there was a big bad whether it was human or not. Yeah. And that's something that's extremely Western. Uh, and again, we're the fish swimming in the water, we don't realize it. Um, and what that's turned my work into, which is this trilogy, is it starts out as classic single, you know, bad guy, good guy, conflict, and the character evolves because, spoiler alert, he turns into something more than human that he starts be, he starts as an individual, but the personality evolves into understanding he needs a collective. So it's kind of like Dorothy, <laughs> you know, entering Oz and realizing, well, I need a little of this and a little of this and a little of this. And, and that all of that together creates not just a personality, but a movement. And seeing ourselves, I think the whole idea of a collective or God forbid you were use the word in our culture, collectivism is somehow negative to enough people that they just shut down. They, they don't listen to it without realizing that we all live within a culture. We all live within a society. No one is by themselves. No one is a pure individual, as I love telling my father who was pulled himself by, by his bootstraps, um, that you know, we do have to look at these things as a group of people together solving the big problems. So this speaks back to um, what Cecil was saying earlier about community and promoting community. Um, and uh, Cory Doctor had talked about the um, uh, zombie apocalypse, getting a gun to protect the house as being the wrong narrative. I didn't know, Cecil, if you had thoughts on, on sort of how like in fiction you can yeah, I mean, I one thing that I was also thinking about too is that you know some of the writing that uh, some of us do is our own creator owned stuff, but um, but like Sheree and I, you know, we work with licensed characters, and I'm sure some of you also have as well. And I, it was I was just trying to think about like you know what PJ was saying about that three act structure and like how there's a sort of demand when you're writing a superhero comic that certain things have to happen, you know, and um, and. Uh, this isn't really answering your question, but I just want to like talk about the license thing for a minute because that's when you're dealing with a world that is very set and um, to try to bring in the idea of community and to try to bring in the idea of activism or change in some way. I did a, a book, The Female Furies. Female Furies are a hell. Um, they're a team of women who are the most elite fighting force on this hell planet for this evil guy named Apocalypse, uh, uh, Dark Side, and they live on Apocalypse, so you know it's a bad place. And um, and I told the story where they have a Me Too movement on this hell planet. And the the trick was that you know they're still evil, they're terrible, terrible people, and and that that they could have growth in that moment, and that they could have social growth, and you know sort of um, trying to make a better world in in their in their hell way. And when you're working with that three act structure or that sort of traditional sort of demands of uh, license, uh, and I'm sure Sheree can talk to this as well. Um, you know, with um, Avatar, it's very difficult because you're trying to sort of like um, slip in these sort of grander ideas into the interstices of uh, 
of the, 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 the sort of rigid storytelling that you have to do? You know, I, I think um, for me, in some ways I've been lucky with Avatar has this whole um, philosophy uh, behind it, this whole um, uh, uh, sort of a faith. And um, what I'm given then are wise characters who can put forth um, ideas. So even if your story sticks to a sort of combat um, or conflict-based structure, um, it's the conversations that happen in and around those expected trope points that um, I think can stay with people yeah. and also can slightly color how now that you know what a character is thinking or feeling while they're acting out the necessary movements also sort of, I think, makes it a little bit richer. Um, at least that's what I tell myself. I hope it does. Yeah, and I think I try to do that with them by building community, you know, by having the women, the female furies, you know, sort of come together to make a change, you know, or, um, you know, have, have like the, the collaboration and rather than the like, I'm just going to like, you know, be for, be for myself, which is I think what you were talking about, Kate. Do you all um, now, given current events, feel like a heavier responsibility in uh, what it is that you'll put out in your fiction? Or um, hell yeah, yeah. And do you have at all a fear of becoming too like moralizing in what you say, since we're all feeling very strongly about things? I don't. I don't feel a sense of responsibility to uh, some unnamed mass. I feel a, a sense of responsibility to my family and to my community which is a totally different kind of stance. Um, so I feel like I want to make people feel better. I want them to, to um, yeah, that's good. know that they can go forward. Um, and uh, so along those lines, uh, uh, when, when you were talking about, um, Cecil, when you were talking about uh, Cory Doctorow and um, the social version of, responding to a trauma which is tend and befriend right other than fight or flight um i was talking with him about that recently too and he recommended a book to me by rebecca solnit mm -hmm. oh, a yeah. paradise built in hell um and and you know he used the, the uh the knowledge that he got from that i think pretty deeply in his work so i think I, th I see everybody's nodding and, and saying, yes, yes, yes. We all use this, right? <laughs> Rebecca's, book, Rebecca's book sort of goes through um, a variety of major disasters and shows how in times of crisis, the, um, the government, the authority structure tends to become combative and the uh, grassroots community become self-supportive. We, we band together to help one another um, despite what the, the, um, you know, the industrial complex might be doing. Yeah, they're, they're shutting down borders and we're helping people over fences. It's that, that seems to be the human response, um, that she really illuminates beautifully in that book. Yeah. Yeah. I don't know if I'm particularly feel a, a specific responsibility as much as like mo most of the time that, that my drive for fiction is, is from a, Kind of an emotion that's sort of just on the you know liminal conscious subconscious it's like a certain feeling that i need to express but i i definitely do feel that there i, I really have to be careful about wanting to convey that there are potential futures that are better than the one we're living in now because i really really feel as i said earlier that so much of our default vision of the future is dystopic is dystopian and you can see that really clearly if you go on google and you google you know sci-fi city sci-fi image they're all dystopian even like you know exactly. uh you know even the clothing that people wear in the future it's all militarized it's all like battle gear and, and i i know a lot of this comes from like video games but it's like it, it is like is that what our only vision of the future is militarized is our only vision of the future polluted cities and, and, you know, chaos and, and, uh, you know, uh, authoritarian political systems. So I, I think like when I sit down to, to write something, 
specific, specifically in the novel I'm working on now, very, very um, diligently trying to write against that trope and, and trying to, um, like you play it really close. So the reader's like, oh, I know where you're going. And then when you don't go there, they're like, oh, oh wow, that's not a, that's not a possibility that I considered, but that's really cool. I didn't think of that. So it's, it's more about, I guess, giving people ideas of what could be possible. I think that's also really important. Sorry, Sheree. I think that's really important too when, um, when you consider how so many people who work in the world of science go, you know, cite science fiction as the reason why they decided that they were going to dream up and build something. And so I feel like it would be cool if we could offer young people or, you know, people who are, you know, uh, trying to dream up what kind of, what kind of science, where they fit in in science, you know, could uh, dream up the, the cool, the cool new green things or, you know, um, um, whatever. And I think that's an important part. So I, I don't think that it's something that I think of, but it's something that definitely rides, it's my ride along. I'm, I'm gonna um, jump back into my enchantivism for a minute and say that um, right now we are living in the machine age. Um, we've left the natural sort of the earth age and we're living in a machine age and everything is, um, everything's replaceable. Everything can be ground down and nothing feels. And there's this um, concept of machine brain versus garden brain. And what if, um, I was looking at your shirt math um, that says, uh, the Weyland Yutani shirt that says building better worlds. And I was right. thinking, what if it said growing better worlds? Mm. Like just right. shifting to a more organic terminology can change your mindset, oh, yeah. you know? And, and, it's, and I think that we do, we do feed um, the current and the future scientists and believers. And there are some programs out there. I think Lightbringer here in LA, they have um, a science fiction contest that adults can enter and one that kids can enter. And uh, the teen one also has, um, I think it's called the Green Feather Award. It's uh, sponsored by the Audubon Society. And it is for the best piece of short fiction by a young person that shows a positive future. And um, I was a judge a few years ago and this girl wrote about, it was a very high tech, um, it was funny, it was a sweet story of a little girl in a very high tech house, but they kept bees. And she, it turns out this girl who wrote it was a bee ambassador and she actually travels to schools teaching children about the importance of bees. And like that gave me such hope. Yeah. And I feel that, um, you're right. If we can seed in, even if our ideas are crazy and we don't know how, you know, we have to fudge the science to make it believable, um, do it. If you do it convincingly, then somebody who actually understands science is going to think it's possible. Mm -hmm. and read pushes further than you know it's the first person to break the you know the four minute mile or whatever suddenly all these people can do it so we are we're, it's the only way I'm ever going to break a four minute mile is through <sighs> writing so you know <laughs> go for it so um how can we how can we sort of open up that word world of possibility uh through our writing. I mean, I think, I think that was a nice, I was thinking of um, in Star Trek, how stuff that seemed kind of absurd, I think that was fudge science, a lot of it. And yet a lot of it we've seen actualized now, you know? So um, do you have any like tips for it? Cause there are some questions from writers. Do you have tips for writers out there on how they can sort of rethink or open up their thinking about um, putting possibility into their work? I always think talking to scientists begets ideas. So I talk to scientists all, all the time. Today I talked to an astronaut, you know, like just because it's like I'm tr always trying to think and he's trying to figure out how to build a space station on the moon. And it's like, okay, yeah, well, let's talk about that. That's pretty, uh, you know, crazy. Um, I mean, not crazy. It's going to happen. But um but I think talking to scientists helps you to sort of dream up new sort of crazy things because they're always like, well, we think that if we can do this, then maybe this will happen. And then 5 million stories are born in my brain, you know? Um, I would say uh, yes. And also um, make sure that you are open to ideas that are uh, at current, outside of the current scientific paradigm. Um, 
because um, that what's what's happening now, the received wisdom, that's great. But it's not. It's like you say. It's 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 a crazy idea, but it might work, especially if somebody like writes about it in a in a moving and convincing way, or a humorous way, or something that gets through people's uh, intellectual guards. Um, one of the things that impressed me back in 2016 uh, was a woman named Rashida Phillips who. Um, was talking, uh, she's a writer out of Philadelphia. Uh, she was talking about the idea that time is a lie. And I was just like, what? No, no, no. Time is, time is how we all get to come to dinner at the, at the same place, you know. And, and, you know. But um, she, she was actually talking about something a little deeper and it, that got me into alternate history and alternate futures come from alternate history. So um what's the lyrics uh they're they're not safe for work um free your free your mind and your ass will follow <laughs> and then another oh, oh, sorry oh i was just gonna jump for one second on what nisi said also i think the thing about science that is not the popular most funded science that's happening right now is oftentimes the new science where the new ideas come from. So I think it's important to pay attention what's new, but also important to like pay attention to the science that like everyone's like, ah, they're the crazy people. It's like, yeah, that's who I want to talk to. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. So I, I was going to jump in, in and say that Sorry. not only uh, do you want to look at the crazy science, you want to look at the, the really cutting edge stuff, the things in material science where you're like, wait, Mm -hmm. weightless matter wait how did that happen you know things that are that are still so far out there that nothing's actually been done with it yet it's still the building blocks of a new version of a material world the flip side is that go backwards learn your history thank you <laughs> learn your history and learn your different cultures because there are such deep wells to mine in cultural histories. Also the things we've forgotten. Uh, I've just been watching this with COVID. Uh, suddenly pulmonologists and doctors are doing things that used to be the old science for the first half of the 20th century before antibiotics were being done, positioning, posturing uh, people's bodies for these, disease, for these respiratory diseases. I was taught that when I was a tiny child and I've never heard a doctor teach it since. It disappeared for over 50 years, and now I'm watching this medicine come back and it's actually saving lives. That's just one small example of all of these things we've forgotten because our world told us it wasn't important anymore. And now it's desperately important because the things we are using aren't working. Preach it, PJ. <laughs> I think, you know, also just um, reading widely, of course, um, but like specifically with, with science, it's just not getting your information from, from one source, but many, many sources. And, you know, at least the way my brain works is like, I get all these little data points from, from things I read, and then I kind of create this like mind map and say, okay, we're, we're here now, we might be here in a little while, and then I sort of just jump off off that point. So I, I feel as if it's like, you know, you know, Bradbury talks about this in, in uh, I think um, his, his books on writing is like, you, you know, you just feed your brain with stuff and then your brain like spills it out. Like it comes out of your subconscious. So it's like, you know, you just got to pour that information in and, and get it from everywhere. You know, like, you know, I'm on like the weird, really weird, obscure subreddits, like where people are just, I'm like, really, you, you believe that? I mean, I don't respond, I just sort of lurk. And it's just fascinating to see like, like how the human brain works like this, you know, what people think and what they believe. And, and some of it's fascinating. And, and some of it, like, I was like, there's no way I'm going to believe this, this stuff. This is completely like non-scientific and gobbledygook. But then like I'm reading along and I'm like, wow, this person's making a whole lot of sense. This is totally crazy. And, and like I'm, I'm as interested as if I were reading a, you know, a work of fiction. I'm just totally engrossed. So um, yeah, like, like I wouldn't just, just focus on like, you know, the, the, um, the known stuff, the main stuff, you know, just seek out all sources of information 
Um, but yeah, I mean, I, I feel as if um, going for that cutting edge stuff. What, what is the, uh, the, the, the MIT blog that, that talks a lot about that? Is it, um, I'm blanking on it. I, uh, I know there's like futurism.com and then there's the, uh, what is it? Oh, MIT oh. Technology Review. Yeah. And, and so like stuff like that, where they're like post cutting edge stuff. And sometimes it's just a little snippet, but it's like, wow, this is, this is real. This is stuff they're working on. That's really cool. Also join communities mm -hmm. because so many of the communities have so much to offer in a variety of ways. I could never have written a trilogy uh, if I hadn't actually joined uh, groups like the Extropians and transhumanists. And I, you know, thank God I'm not a journalist because I did the worst thing you can do. I crossed the line and I ended up chairing the World's Transhumanist Association. I rebranded it to Humanity Plus because, you know, I actually work with words. And, uh, you know, I actually worked within those worlds so that I got to understand very deeply where they're coming from. So, and, and not look at them as an outsider actually looking at people who are doing this stuff, researching this stuff, building this stuff, brain computer interfaces and longevity medicine and, you know, to, to a point where they're not, they're, they're in their full complexity. I wanted to open it up to questions as uh, we have only have a little bit of time left. Um, and we have had a few of them, but let's start off with the, the geekiest one, uh, which I think we can all, um, we all like. Uh, would you consider the Star Trek series a utopia? I'm going to take that because <laughs> I want to say something about other things, but also like total Star Trek nerd. And, um, and no, obviously it's not, right? Um, it was the way that, I'll push my glasses up, it was the way that Roddenberry envisioned it. And then the TV people said, let's make it militarized. And he was very much against that. Um, but obviously they were striving towards something. If you go with what Matt said of Utopia being uh, a verb, they are definitely trying really hard to Utopia. <laughs> but, um, but it did not. And then it gets more dystopic as the iterations of the show go on. Um, and I think that's a response to audience. Um, it's, I, it's also so human centered, right? It's like, it you know, it's, it's like if it's going to be, if it's going to be a true utopia, you know, then it has to be a universal opia, you know? Yeah. Well, I, I think we also, those are the limits of uh, makeup special effects, right? Like everybody's got to be a biped who, you know, um, you only get the occasional Horta that looks like a rock. Um, <laughs> but I, I, you know, I want to just very quickly say about, uh, about everybody who's giving these great suggestions for science in your work and I say also look at the spiritual side of things and yes. uh, and some sort of planetary empathy don't just think about what humans can do think about everything else that lives on this planet work that into your writing and you might be closer to a utopia because it's inclusive thank you that's an awesome point uh, Nisi had wanted to talk about the five petals of thought <laughs> uh, just um, it's I'm interested I, it's one of those things, um, I had a dream where someone was asking me why I didn't use the five petals of thought to solve a problem at work. And I said, oh yeah, right, I should have done that. And uh, then I like, you know, in the dream, I was like looking at the school where it was taught. And then I woke up and, you know, Googled it and no, there, <laughs> there's no such thing. But um, it's an imaginary activist um, historical movement that started with a bunch of factory workers and uh, freed uh, enslaved people um, in like the 1700s in the US and spread worldwide. Um, and uh, yeah, yeah, the, and we get a better future with that by changing the past. Make it so. <laughs> <laughs> Um, another question was, uh, and I'm not certain if, if we've touched on it, but if any uh, new thoughts strike folks, how should we as authors reframe the story? How far do we take it to have it accepted by readers? This is from Kess, a writer of Paranormal, Supernatural, and Urban Fantasy. Are you asking about gatekeepers, Kess? That's yeah. what I want to know. 
Uh, Kess, you can write the answer to that in the, ch in the chat if you like. If you're I mean, still I think there. you take it as far as you want to take it, right? So you're, mm -hmm. you're the creator of the work. You, you should express yourself the way you want to. Mm -hmm. um, gonna, and then le leave it to the, re the readers and the editors to decide if they, you know, if they want to read it or publish it. I mean, I don't know. I, I'm always uh, reluctant to ever tell anyone how or what to write. I'm going to put this out there, the idea that the stories don't come from us, don't belong to us. They come through us and they're telling yes. us what we need to hear. And so follow the story, follow the story, do what it tells you. And then, you know, fix the typos and see if you can <laughs> publish yeah. it. And another, and uh, Kes furthered it by saying, um, how far into the future do we go to help people see it? I would argue, I mean, PJ goes very close, Cecil goes very far. Um, Where do you feel comfortable as yeah, far as you want to go? It's honestly, yeah. you know, I, I feel comfortable. I knew I was writing an alternate history. I'm an American history freak. Um, so it was natural for me to set this story in this context. It was near term uh, re uh, technology I wanted to deal with. So everything just kind of fit. Take it where it leads. I mean, it, truly think about the science fiction that takes place tens of thousands of years in the future. You can go anywhere you want with this. Mm -hmm. And besides time is a lie. Yes. <laughs> right. Yes, time I have a TARDIS, I could I prove it. Prove it. Time, time is a lie. And I write about that too. So it's a big I think lie. we're also learning it in the quarantine that time is a lie. I think it's a capitalist construct. Now that we've all kind of, we're starting to lose our clocks. Where can we take this in a positive way, you know? Time yeah, is the water and we're just the fish that swim in it. <laughs> I, I always like, uh, um, I always like the term um, anywhere and any when, you know, like that's, mm -hmm. that's what you, that's what you can do. That's right. Okay. Uh, are there more questions from anyone? I've, I've got a, I want to jump in with a question. Yeah. So I would love to hear what books have been inspiring to you when you're looking at brighter futures, when you're looking at writing them, on your own, like what have you looked to that have been inspiring? You mean besides Rebecca Solnit? <laughs> <laughs> Maybe more than just her. <laughs> I, I'm, I'm gonna say Corey. I mean, I really think that yeah, his, his, his yeah. Corey Doctorow is just a real master at that. And his brain is so, I mean, he just thinks about everything on every angle. I would highly recommend his new um, novel that um, came out last year called Walk Away. I, I think that's- yeah, it's a really yeah. interesting, yes. really interesting uh, book about thinking about all of this kind of stuff from many different angles, you know, and um, so he's just wonderful. He also had a series of short stories that just came out. Uh, one that I loved was uh, called Radicalized Fred. So, um, yeah, I would, I would just check out Cory Doctor. Yeah, I really loved... Um... Kim Stanley Robinson's 2312. That was just yes. really eye-opening for me. It was just a vision of humanity's future that I just, it blew me away. Um, I love uh, Ian M. Banks' uh, culture novels. I think there's, there's a vision of humanity's future that is uh, grand yeah. and, and beautiful. Um, Ursula K. Le Guin's work, a lot of it, mm -hmm. I, f I find really uh, inspiring and optimistic. Um, we haven't really... Uh, spoken about uh, films that much, but um, I think Interstellar, uh, even though it, it is kind of about a, uh, <laughs> a, a plague affecting the earth, I think that there's a, a spirit in that film that captures uh, like the human optimism that I really love. And um, Her, the movie Her, which is just talking before about um, a film or, or narratives without a, a uh, like, an evil antagonist. It's just, it's, it's a story about evolution of characters and they just evolve apart. It's basically, you know, the story of a singularity. So uh, what else? Ancillary Justice and Lecky. Um, yeah, those were great. Uh, trying to think of, of other books, but yeah, it's um, Cory Doctorow's Walk Away, You Stole That From Me. That, that book uh, blew me away. 
Yeah, me too. Yeah, I was going to say that one. Um, I will uh, say a couple of short stories. I'm going to steal one from uh, PJ in the uh, remarks. Uh, now, you were talking about the movie Arrival. Um, actually, I oh, yeah. uh, yeah. like right. the, short well, the short story. story. The yeah. story is beautiful. Of course. Yeah. 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 Um, I, again, time is a lie. And uh, <laughs> also, um, I, I would uh, recommend both um, those uh, who walk away from, or the ones who walk away from Omalas by yeah. Lequin, mm -hmm. that short story, and then in conversation with that, N.K. Jemison's The Ones Who Stay and Fight. Yeah. Right. Yes, and great another, response to that. Yeah. Yes, I, I think those two really need to be read together. Mm -hmm. Does anyone, can I ask also, does anyone have thoughts about Octavia Butler? She's, you know, unfortunately passed many years now, but there's this ongoing reckoning with her works for as we like moved in this very dark time i feel like people are turning to her for stories that show characters living through the worst and continuing on well, i'm thinking you know, of her xenogenesis trilogy in uh, particular so i you know i you say octavia butler to me and the first thing i think of is um parable of the sower and um, and that was a series that was incomplete. She died before she could finish the last book. But um, you know, it, it's hard not to pull it out. Um, especially 2016, there is a politician in that book that is using the exact same "Make America Great Again" slogan. Um, wow. That it's eerie. Yeah, it's it's painful. But until you know your history and that know that that was a slogan back in the 1930s because fascism is a perennial favorite. Um, so I think that her stories can be very dark um, in the present, but they show um, a movement towards hope. So in that, the ACORN movement, um, which rises out of um, Olamina's um, philosophy that God is change, um, actually has a following. They have a website. That's a community you could probably join. Um, yes, Earthseed. And it's the idea yeah. of, of, um, of we have to leave this planet, which I am against personally. Um, so it's, it's interesting. It's hard for me to feel inspired by a lot of the books that are out there because they also mean accepting some really harsh realities. Um, so I, I would, um, yeah, I, but she's definitely a writer for our time um, and for every time from when she first wrote those books on up. If I can mention one more, uh, and this relates to also another research thing for writers. So uh, the Foundation series was really foundational for me. And I discovered a bunch of scientists, most of them biological statisticians who were, uh, and particularly a professor at UConn named Peter Turchin, who created a historical analysis system called Clio Dynamics. So it's basically scientists looking at history, modeling the past, all, and every part that we can come up with from food sources, wars, diseases, population, everything that we would look at in an ecosystem. And looking at us as an ecosystem and watching what turns out to be this very even, very regular sign curve of history, where we pass in and out of feast and famine, war and peace, uh, income inequality and egalitarianism, uh, all of these aspects of, of what our societies engender. And I really recommend people thinking in terms of their storytelling. What I, I, I guess, you know, looking at foundation and Peter Turchin actually created Cleo Dynamics because of Harry Selden, because mm -hmm. of psychohistory. Uh, he was completely inspired by the notion that we could not just model it in the past, but then predict it in the future. And so far right now, Turchin and his fellow Cleo dynamicists, if that's a word, <laughs> uh, have done an incredible job modeling over the last decade or so, you know, about 10 years ago, he was like, okay, 2020 to 22, it's all going to be the pips. We're going to hit the, and, and right on schedule, by the way, we go in these 50 year, 100 year and 200 year cycles, and we are right on schedule. So there's, um, for me, ironically, knowing that we have these cycles has been incredibly inspiring because we get out of these times. We come into them. 
we have choices to make when we go into them. Do we vote for the person who will be more likely to be better for us during these times, or do we just pick the obvious horrible choice? This time we picked the bad choice. In previous times, we picked better choices. You know, we picked Abraham Lincoln last time around we, when we were in a, a, you know, those kinds of um, political and social crises. So we've done well before. This time we didn't do so well. So it means we're gonna have a worse nadir in our dip, but it also means we're coming back up again. It's just how. And in every period of time, we've done it differently. So I have optimism because this is a period where we can, <laughs> we can only go up. This is, if you think of it in terms of, um, of uh, the, the hero's journey, um, but also the sacred marriage of the hero's journey in the upper world, it's the masculine and the lower world is the feminine. We're in the mature masculine phase right now, which is we have slain the dragons and done all the things and we're still dissatisfied. And as a society, we're moving into the underworld um, to communicate with the mature feminine, which is learning acceptance, appreciation, and we will, as PJ said, rise again and cycle again. Cycle again. Because time's a lie, but the cycle is the same. <laughs> <laughs> the, the cycle is why time's a lie. <laughs> right, exactly right. <laughs> and I think watching the nature right now gives a bit of hope. We went to see the bioluminescence in the Santa Monica Bay that Aww. for the first time in years and years and years uh, has appeared again, simply because planes are not going over and ships are not going through. So. Um, yeah. There was a um, sort of a question statement here, which is uh, uh, Gabe had said, I wonder if there's something in humans that naturally draws us to dystopian stories, or maybe that's all that gets served to us, which, what do you I, guys think? I think that um, it's, for one thing, I think that we're drawn to the opposite of whatever we're experiencing. Um, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, and, and also, though, I think that um, it, it, is, um, it is what's served to us. It's, it's what we're trained to enjoy. Mm -hmm. I, I, I answered Gabe in the chat, but my feeling is it's the same reason why I watch zombie movies. It's because if that happens, I want to know how to survive. So yeah. there is, it's just like every fairy tale that taught us how to survive. It's a cautionary tale. We want to understand how bad can it get so I know what to do about it. You know, I don't like, like to be scared. <laughs> the thing that I love about this uh, COVID-19 crisis is that uh, someone else said this. This is not original to me. The skills that are getting us through this are not your, like, you know, wielding the axe and slaying the zombie kind of skills. It's sewing and <laughs> That is Gardening. the mature feminine. That yeah. is us going into the underworld, right? We've all been sent inward. We've all been sent inward, and now we're all making our sourdough starters. <laughs> and Planting yeah. seeds. And sewing our masks. And, you know, and no longer consuming. We are now appreciating what we have. Mm -hmm. like, right? Like, when did you ever think it would feel like a triumph to have eight rolls of toilet paper all at once? <laughs> <laughs> and uh, self-sacrifice, right? Like yeah. we're saying like, I am not doing all of these things because I know that that might help someone else. Yeah. Yes, this is, this is nurturing humanity. By the, 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 the willingness to stay inside is to protect other people as well as ourselves. And that's the most generous movement I've seen on this planet in a long time because it is nearly and I think also it's like, it's like, I don't look, I mean, we probably all don't look at things the same way, right? Like I don't look at my pantry the same. I don't look at the, the way that I use things the same, even though I did keep a pantry before I did cook before I did garden before I did recycle before, but now it's like, it's like sort of caring for the, the micro bubble, um, you know, is helping the sort of the bigger bubble as well. And if I can go back to Nisi's original statement that we tend to like the thing that's the opposite of where we're at, just never forget that as creators, that right now, nobody wants to read dystopia. They just don't because we're living it. We're living a situation that we realize how dangerous at so many different levels it is. And look back to the history of entertainment. 
what were we watching during the Great Depression? Mm -hmm. Musicals. <laughs> true, true. Musicals, screwball comedies where one of the most successful comedies of the period was called My Man Godfrey, mm -hmm. where a guy loses all his money, is living, he's homeless, living, right. you know, among Skid Row, gets a job, where, teaches the rich people how to be good people, and then creates a business where everyone who is homeless now has a job on the land that the homeless were living on. And, and that was the, probably the one of the most successful comedies of the period. Yeah. And this was the hopefulness that people needed. Well, and it's super rich, right? Like during the Great Depression, like every one of those films is like, you know, about like people who have scouts of money and fabulous dresses and <laughs> to eat, you know? <laughs> Exactly. But there are a surprising number of people who were in, uh, like, viewing Contagion now, which baffles me. But so I think there is. That's Shree's, that's what zombie. Shree was saying. Right. That's yeah. Shree's zombies. Being prepared. <laughs> what do I do? And um, my daughter was talking about people having Contagion proms, where both parties got tested and had a little dance in the living room, kind of thing. So, you know, we do look to fiction both ways. I think for sure. There's a question in the chat. Um, what do you each What do you each think will be the best outcome of the COVID crisis? Somebody else. <laughs> well, I mean, the one thing that I'm seeing from an environmental standpoint is that all across the world, people are reporting like bluer skies, clearer waters. You were talking mm -hmm. about the phosphorescent bay. I mean, here in, in New York City, the sky is bluer. It's a, it's a California blue. I've never seen it like this. Sometimes in the fall for like a week or two, you get these blue, blue skies, but like every day that the sun is out, it's amazing. And I just hope, I hope that, um, you know, people will become more appreciative of this and want it to last longer and, mm -hmm. and think about, you know, how we treat the environment a little bit better. Um, you know, I just I just saw a report today in the New York Times that um, renewables just overtook coal in the United States for the first time, so that's a positive thing. And um, so, yeah, I mean, I'm just I'm just hoping that um, you know, from an environmental standpoint, that we just um, we come out of this with uh, with with a greater appreciation for for uh, the, the environment that we live in. I would love to see. Um a national timeout every month then, you know, let yeah. there be a week, a week every month, because we've proven you can work from home um, for a lot of people, not everybody, certainly, but let people stay home for that week. We don't drive. We let the earth breathe. You know, we walk places, we go outside for walks instead. And, um, and once a month or, or hell, I'd settle for quarterly at this point. I think <laughs> it would be great. I'm hoping that all the scientists are, are keeping track of the data of how much these few months off have um, in every department, in oceans, in, you know, people who monitor air quality and people in green energy. Because one nice thing is that the um, big oil has taken a major hit in these past few months. And that is something it would be nice to see destabilized uh, and people to start thinking a little more about um, green energy and that perhaps it can make money. When you think about mythology, um, we draw our energy from the underworld. That's where fossil fuels come from. So if we can draw it from the sun instead, that's already flipping the script. Yeah. Uh, Ramez Nam, another great author, uh, is working very seriously in renewable energy futurism. And he just reported that solar energy has now become so radically cheap it is cheaper to build and deploy from scratch than to run legacy fossil fuel energy production mm. oh cool so if that is in fact the case now there is no excuse for us as a society to not figure out the best places to deploy these and get going yeah and also we were talking earlier about like the cutting edge science i mean I'm reading all the time about breakthroughs in solar panel efficiency. So that's right. You know, well, that's part of where see, this comes from. Yeah, yeah we're going to see, you know, even cheaper solar energy. The only thing 
Oh, no, go ahead, you, yeah. Oh, sorry, I, I just wanted to say, I love to travel, I travel a lot, um, but you know, I hope that, um, that we all uh, come out of this thinking more about uh, being better about when we choose to travel and how we travel, um, because I think we've shown that we can do a lot of things, um, you know, not by actually being there. And I think that that, um, that really helps, you know, helps to reduce sort of um, uh, all, all of that. Yeah, like that, that's actually one of the few things as I was listening to you guys, I was like, what? But actually, it, it, um, if we do have a good outcome from this, it will be with things like uh, what we have today with, with this, with um, a, an increasingly uh, digitized uh, presence um, and community. And um, I also think that um, non-digital um, communities also can, can be stronger um, post-COVID-19. Um, if there is a post, um, then, then that would be um, one of the things that I think is developing and that will continue. Uh, I've seen a lot more neighbors looking after each other and communities yeah. right. really checking yeah. in and seeing the, w the webs are getting smaller in a good way, um, and people looking after each other. They're getting stronger too, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, mm -hmm. I have various people coming to me and saying, I need to buy your groceries for you. That is a good thing. <laughs> yeah, it's real. Yeah. I think there's something too, to the fact that everyone who survives this, everyone in the planet is affected by this. And it's maybe one of the first times where we all go through something together and we're all so intertwined and in communication with each other. So that for the rest of our lives, we're gonna have this in common. And it's a, mm -hmm. you know, it's a starting point for common ground and maybe a better collaboration. I also think there's a potential that whatever the historical nadir, because you could see this as a black swan in the sense that we knew it was going to happen eventually, we would have a pandemic, we just didn't know where or when. Um, but that this might actually short circuit the worst history on this timeline. Hmm. Because people, instead of falling into very gradual frog in the pot fascism, which is generally how it works, um, we now have seen unbelievably quickly the failure of our institutions. It's thrown into high relief what works and what doesn't work. And we can look at other countries and go, wait a second, <laughs> how come it's working over there? So one of the great outcomes is I think we will finally, in different countries, be able to look at our neighbors and say, wow, you really are doing it better than we are. How do we do that? There's um, an author, a writer, um, Patrick Nathan, who's described American culture as the, the normalization of psychological torture of the marginalized. And yeah, like yeah. the stuff that he's writing is, is, is the type that you read it and you're like, oh, now I see the world through a different lens and I appreciate that that's happened. And I, I, you know, I, the question that was on my mind as we were coming together for this event was like, what does it take to change a culture? And what is the role of, for us to be part of that? And so I'm, I'm so stories. grateful we've heard from you today about it. Yeah, It's stories. The culture is built by stories. And it's the stories that we tell each other. And it's the stories that we mm -hmm. are myths and what we aspire to. That's, that's what shapes a culture. Yeah. And if we can flip that narrative to um, community. I Because I was talking um, to my daughter, too, about how, I, you know, we when World War II happened, there was this national narrative that was like, you know, we're all pulling together. Yes. And we are very much lacking that right now. We are hearing it right. from yeah. some mayors here and there. Um, so if, if perhaps if the community can keep that narrative going despite um, our national institutions not working. And I think, it's, I think it's important too to remember that no matter how loud the voice is that is shouting, it doesn't mean that the yes. stories that are needed and necessary aren't being told and they are still there for us when the shouting stops <laughs> those <laughs> yes and a lot of you are telling this story so thank you very much um thank you all for being here tonight this was great thanks for thank having you, us thank you thank you, thank you. Yes, thank you. Thank you everyone, everyone.